This is The Healthy Healer, where true voice is your medicine. This is where we help doctors and other healers navigate through the challenging times by learning from the best minds in the healing industry. Laugh, cry, and be surprised. It's entertainment, education, and inspiration so you can continue to be the unique and amazing healer you were destined to be. Welcome to humanity. Welcome to The Healthy Healer with Dr. Fred. Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Fred, and I'm the founder and creator of the Healthy Healer podcast. And what I like to do is present people who are healthy healers, people who are helping other people be healthy by becoming healthy themselves and then resonating harmonically with them to create a healing environment that allows people to actually grow and develop just by being riding the same train as the clinician or as the helper, as the healer. And the guest that I have today, very special guest, who I've also been on her show not so long ago and just last month, is Kara Goodwin. And Kara likes to call herself a meditation mindfulness specialist. And another thing she has that I think is catchy inside of her bio is that she's like a personal trainer for spiritual aspirants. It's really a wonder to have people like this on the planet who have really caught up with how to deal with all the challenges, hurdles, and obstacles that await us all the difficulties that each and every one of us are dealing with the circumstances in the world around us. And everyone has always dealt with very serious circumstances around them. You can read back in the time, back even in Plato's days, people were dealing with very serious circumstances. And it's true, we are, it seems like it's gotten even more circumstantial, more difficult, more challenging in recent times. And we have to find a way to grab ourselves and give ourselves a groundedness a capacity to uh, be sane in this insane world, a capacity to actually land like a tree and be rooted and to carry on in a way that is consistent with our core self and our core values. And I believe that's what Kara Goodwin actually specializes in. But we're about to learn a lot more about who she is, how she was, how she got here, what she does, and how you can actually get to know her more if, in fact, that's something you want to do, which more than likely it will be at the end of this conversation. So Kara, thank you so much for coming on the Healthy Healer podcast. It's a wonder and privilege and honor to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dr. Fred. And I just have loved so much your episode that you had on the meditation conversation. And a lot of people have loved that. It's been, I've gotten a lot of great feedback about that. So thank you for everything that you're doing to help people move forward and break out of the paradigm that's been there for decades. Yeah, there is a paradigm here. There's a paradigm here that I think we both share needing to counter counteract or combat is might even be another way, although that's a little bit aggressive. Maybe counteract is good enough. And that is this idea that we're stuck being a certain way. We're stuck actually accepting a paradigm. We're stuck. We're too busy to get still. We don't have any time to actually get grounded. I'll get grounded after I finish my unending infinite business that I need to take care of. I don't have time to do things differently than whatever the default is that they're serving up to me, whether that's through the era of of mindfulness or groundingness or meditation or yoga or all the stillness efforts that are here. It's no, I can't learn Tai Chi. I can't learn Qigong because I don't have time. When in fact, that's really just a massive illusion. And it goes along a little bit with some of the struggle that I've had, but people don't have a real notion that they can do something different than take on the conventional way of how they've learned to take on life. Now, the truth is, no one has actually taught them that way. It's just a default that we've come to accept in in an agreement reality that there's so much work to do and so little time to actually take on considering a different direction. But that's not the way you and I think, and certainly not the way that you think. I really want to know, the first question I want to know, and this is something that's pretty pretty standard in a previous podcasts that I posted, is Kara Goodwin, who are you? That's a great question. Right, nine nine <laughs> letters, I? fully grammatically correct, and sends you back on your heels a little bit. <laughs> yes. Let's, okay, what moment are we in? Because we are dynamic beings who are if we're living in the flow, in this kind of life as a flow, we are changing a lot and we're allowing 
that change to happen. I do feel like I, out of necessity, I am many. I have a lot of different versions of myself because I live in the Midwest in America and I'm a, a mom and a wife and I've got like my suburban life. I j literally just came from a soccer game. I left, yeah, that's perfect. you know, at halftime. So yes. Soccer mom on a Saturday afternoon. Perfect. Exactly. And my family is very mainstream and, um, and I come from a very mainstream background. Yep. I come from a corporate background. It has been many years now, but I'm surrounded by people who just know me as Hayden's mom or mm -hmm. John's wife or, or yeah. the woman I see at the supermarket. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but then when I'm with people who I feel that resonance that you talked about where it's okay, these people, I'm not going to scare away if I show a little bit more of my true colors. And it's not like I'm pretending to be something else, but if we know that we do have different resonances and we're going to vibrate with people at a different resonance at different times. It's about like feeling into that and what is appropriate for this, where I can have connection with somebody. I just posted on Instagram, a, a meme a couple of days ago that was, it said something about, sorry, sorry for being weird but I'm weird and it'll happen again. <laughs> you know? uh, that's, yeah, that's good. That's really and I, good. I feel like that encompasses me. Like I love the weird and I love to, and the caption that I put in that post was this dance that we do where it's sometimes I do step over that line that somebody's not ready for. And sometimes I do it for fun where I'm like, okay, can I start talking about aliens? with this person? Or can I talk about what happens if I talk about the multiverse or something just to see what happens? But usually it's an accident that I misread. It's like, if I'm going to step over that line, usually I've misread where we were going with the conversation or something, yeah. but, yeah. and it's just this compassion for myself of, oh, whoops. I literally have had people just walk off. Okay. See ya. <laughs> yeah. Like, a little too weird for me. I got to go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which really makes me laugh on the inside. It, and it's like, oh, whoops. But yeah. so in answer to your question, I am so many things. Right. Uh, I, like I said, wife, mother, beekeeper, but Bee also beekeeper. That's really mm -hmm. great. I did see that in your bio as well. I'm not sure if we talked about it last time. I learned from my cats. It sounds like you have dogs and cats as well. I, I got these three cats and these three cats, they just keep me solid. They homeschool me every single day, all three of them. And yeah. they're amazing. And they've been amazing all morning already today. They're just like, they're a solid understand. They're a solid example of a way to take on life they They teach me so much. Like the two of them, all three of them were on the couch together earlier today. And two of them were in a little circle, like a yin yang circle together. And it was a spectacular picture. And I took a picture and sent it to my children. And I just got that they were just so unworried. They were so resting. They were so solid. They were so loving of each other, even it's though so present, so present, they're yeah. so present. And then when they chase each other around and get playful or get rambunctious in one way or another and then they do some stupid stuff and laugh they you can almost see them laughing yeah. and they want to be petted or they want to be loved and they really just ask for it when they're ready all these things that i wish i had a greater handle on or i aspire to have a great handle on with respect to beekeeping I've often wondered about everything that we can learn from a beehive. What can we really learn from beekeeping? Can you speak for a moment or two about what you're learning about mindfulness or about meditation or about groundedness or about presence when dealing with that queen and her army? Yeah, very well said. I switched to last year to like treatment free beekeeping for one thing. So I no longer keep, I don't have movable hives, movable frames anymore where I can take them out and really study the hive. I changed it to be much more like what it's like in the wild. And it's much better for them from a health perspective. You, I don't take the honey from them in traditional beekeeping, you take the honey, you, you replace it with sugar water, you leave them some honey, but you really are supplementing what you take with sugar water, which is like taking mother's milk and then replacing it with a Snickers bar or yeah. Gatorade or something. <laughs> and so I learned more about the bee culture and the kind of, because my whole point with getting into it was like, we need more bees on this planet. Yeah, for sure. 
And they're in conventional beekeeping, at least the way that I was trained, it was like you do everything you can to keep the hive from splitting, from keeping them from swarming, which really means you're actually reducing the population because you're keeping the bees from being able to go and make new hives. You're trying Mm -hmm. to contain them so that you can get more honey. But that's a very long conversation. But now I don't go into the hive anymore. But just the very last time I was there, I had to peek in it. And they're not supposed to come up to the top. It's hard for me to explain because it's a very visual thing, but I don't open it very much and I don't use a smoker or anything to keep them because I can be around them now and just observe them very close up and watch them go in and out of the hive and they don't disturb me because I'm not disturbing them, Um, but I can watch them and I can mow the grass around them and stuff like that and they don't bother me. But I opened the top, not expecting them to have come up into that section of the hive, but I was just going to get a little peek into this particular section. And, oh, I really angered them. And they, the, and it was all senses. Like for me, it was like everything on, like it was unexpected because everything was calm. And I didn't, again, didn't think they'd be up there. Open it. And the noise. they, yeah, right away okay. it was like, and free, right? Is it, yes. Yeah. It was like, here we go, guys, ladies, it's time. Uh, and they came right up. They were all around me. And it was a real test for my nervous system because I went, I'm sure I went into fight or flight because it was like a surprise. But I just immediately closed the lid, stepped back, took a breath. Like it was all really automatic. And I was like, okay, I hear you, but I gave them space and they just, and and it was funny because I walked back around to the front of the hive. I was behind the hive and I had been just observing them on the outside and there weren't that many out. And there were all these bees just all over the front of the hive. They were still like making a, a ruckus from a noise perspective. And I just stood back and watched, but It was, it's really, it fascinates me because they are, you have all these little individual bees, but you have one bigger, yeah, they are composed one apian being. It's one animal that's comprised of all these tiny little bees. And so to see them be able to get into that mode all at once on it, turning on a dime of defend all those moving parts, there's just so much going on with them beyond the senses for one, for all of those thousands of bees to be able to get that signal and act on it immediately. It's like, they're really tuning into the space around them and the energy and the communication outside of just what we might expect, what they can see, what they can hear and so forth. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm very articulate and very vivid and totally appreciative. And I really what I'm hearing, a couple things that shine that you probably don't even notice are like buzzwords as you speak is this idea of them, them being one, first of all, mm. them, like almost a pronoun issue that them, oh, yeah. they are a one. And number two, that they got angry, that they are emotional, that there's a, that they were intruded upon and as one protected themselves and to let you, the intruder know, dude, you don't do that. That is not how things go around here. That's okay. that not, if you don't want to piss us off, then you won't do that again. Yeah. And yet they were also able to be emotional by seeing and hearing and being with you being, you might call it fight or flight, but whatever you did, they didn't attack you. You're right. They did not attack you. They stopped short of that and got your restoration and your apology. They were able to communicate the fact that you did not intend to hurt them and did not intend to actually intrude and invade and inject your silly human self into their world. And they got your apology. They got they got whatever was there enough that they did not attack you, but they made it clear that, yeah, you stepped on my tail or yeah, you, you surprised us or you shocked us or you did something that we don't do around here. You innovated in a direction that we don't appreciate and we don't want you to do it again. If you do it again, we might not be so kind next time. I love that. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right. I could have been stung. I didn't have any protection on. I didn't because again, I I just, I'm with them a lot and they don't go after me. So I don't wear a veil anymore and I don't wear like my big gloves or I may have had gloves on because I was opening the thing. I can't remember, but I don't wear like a protective clothing anymore when I'm around them. So yeah, I could have gotten 
they could have shredded you. They yeah, you. <laughs> totally. <laughs> And yeah, so, so thank you, you. Extra thank you, bees. Thank you. Yeah, there's a real <laughs> communication. There was a back and forth there that was really yeah. great. So one of my cats, again, going back to animals, and I think we'll be able to segue this into meditation and mindfulness momentarily. One of my cats, more than the other two, is uh, he, it's Valentino. And we may, we may have talked about him the first time we spoke, but he's a really special cat. He's a, he's got it going on. He understands English more than any other human I've ever met. He knows what's happening. He listens when we're talking about him. You can see that he's got a, he's living a tragedy, living the, he is, he, you know, he's like a tragic soul. He happens to be, I've had 15 cats in my life really for real. And he's my, he's the prettiest cat I've ever seen. Oh. He's just so totally pretty. And it's a plague for him to be so pretty. <laughs> He's got it. He's like a pretty boy and it's like too bad, but yeah, for him. <laughs> and to be so aware. But one of the things he really does is he requests every morning when I wake up, in fact, to tell you the truth, and this is a great segue, it's when I wake up for my meditation. The first thing I do is I wake up and then I, after taking my remedy, I go and get 20 minutes in. And so I set out to the couch. He sees me coming out of the bedroom. And before I sit down, he's sitting next to me waiting for me to sit down into my meditation. He loves my meditation more than any other cat or anything else that I want. And in fact, finds himself on my lap as part of my lotus position. He's just like right here with me oh. and really gets whatever it is. And you know what else I notice is that in a quiet way, if I should get some agitated run inside of my meditation, he is very aware of that energy shift as well. Without my body changing, without me saying anything, without any new noise, no obvious indication that there's been any changes. When I have an energy shift inside my meditation, if I get worried or if I get afraid or if I get scared, if I get resentful or regretful or something like that, any of the negative vibration experiences, Valentino experiences that and will, no, will either attempt to comfort me or in some cases just jump off my lap. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to be here for this shit. This is, that's, mm -hmm. not what you, that's not what we agreed to. Yeah. We agreed for you quieting. We agreed for you to find yourself. We agreed that it's difficult to be a human. And we agreed that I'm here to assist you in that process. And that's who Valentino is to me. So I want to, this is great. I got it now. So I got the segue, which is the noise that meditation makes inside the cosmic world. The noise of the silence is what I'd like you to address. That even your bees knew that you were steadied. Mm, they yeah. knew you had communicated. You didn't say, hey, back off. You didn't even go in, you, fight or flight, you might have gone into. But one thing you didn't do was go into fight. Had you mm. gone into fight mode, that would have been a different experience. Yeah. Had you started swatting and stuff like that, this would not have gone down as well as it did, for sure. You know that. Yeah. You were able to trust the universe and trust bees and, frankly, trust what is likely in induced by your massive experience with meditation, stillness, and mindfulness to be able to set back inside of a potentially very agitative situation and communicate that across species to bees. Mm. In the same way, I do that with the Valentino each and every morning. And there's something about the noise that mindfulness makes that allows for a cross species uh, communication and connection that maybe is otherwise not often spoken of. I'd really like to hear you speak to the energetic noise that stillness brings into a world that is so chronically agitated. I love that. I love that segue and, and how you put it. And I, when I hear what you're saying, I hear the, the noise as like a, the frequency or the vibration and anybody. That's all noise is, by the way. That's all right. noise is. Yeah, that would be, the, if you look up noise in a dictionary, those two words, frequency and vibration are going to be in that definition. So let's make right. that clear. Yeah. And so I feel like with, sometimes when we talk about energy frequency and vibration, that can start to get like kind of woo for people, yeah, but for it's sure. so scientific like it really is what is happening it's what our plane is made of it's what our our reality is made of and then it's also what the reality beyond our physical experience is made of it's what connects all of us so we can see this with the visible light spectrum if we've ever if you go back to like science middle school science and you've got like the right. colors and how they all have these different 
waves. They have wavelengths and different colors have different wavelengths yeah. and they're, those wavelengths extend beyond the visible color spectrum. You start with red, you go up to purple or white. And before you get to the visible red, you've got infrared. So we yeah. can't necessarily see the infrared with the naked eye, but it's still there. And we've got instrumentation that can pick that up, that can make that a living reality for us that we can't experience. And then once you start getting over past the violet, then you get into ultraviolet. Mm -hmm. And on either side of those two, you've got gamma, you've got x-rays, you've got radio waves and television waves and microwaves and Wi-Fi and all of these things that are really part of our known reality, but we may not think of them as vibration. And so when we think about frequency and vibration, frequency is sim simply the measurement of that vibration and vibration just being like, how is it oscillating? Like how close together are those waves from one peak to another peak mm -hmm. in that wavelength? Yeah. So this is even with physical matter. So we can maybe understand that like we were just talking about, like with colors, with ultraviolet with x-rays with wi-fi all of that maybe that's easier you think about the radio we've got radio waves all around us but the only way we're going to really get in tune with those in this reality is with a radio and then we turn the dial to that specific frequency yeah so that we can hear it so that we can experience it but if we turn the radio off it doesn't mean those radio waves aren't there anymore it's just, True. that's the medium that helps us to experience it. Mm -hmm. So then we have density. We've got, maybe you look at your own body or the table or the chair or the wall or whatever, and think that's just sitting there. That's dense. So maybe it's, that's not energy that we, it might be easy to think because I can touch that. I can see it, that it's, it doesn't look like it's moving. So it doesn't look like energy the way that we might think of energy, but once things start to take shape in this physical reality and they start to get dense so that we can experience them through the five senses. It's just slowed down energy. It's energy that's moving slowly enough that it ha is starting to take on form. And so we are energy. Every human is energy. We are comprised of energy and we are very subtly and under the surface. So without realizing it, we are picking up on the, the energy signals that we are emitting and that we're receiving. We know this. I mean, we can kind of sure. walk down a dark alley at night and just feel how we feel. <laughs> yeah. And we might feel like, I don't know why, but I'm on edge or I feel like I'm picking up on something yeah. Or walk into a dinner party and meet new people. And there are some people that we want to talk to. And there are some people that make us want to go to the bathroom and get yeah. away from them. Yeah. And we may not be able to have language or really even be able to understand like intellectually what it is that makes us repelled or attracted. But it real all of that is happening at the energetic level. And so also animals. They're very much energy beings. And a lot of animals are more tuned into that reality than we are because we, there's so much, you do a beautiful job of talking about programming and how we are just being, being pulled along by life and not necessarily considering other realities or other potentialities. Animals are living in the moment. Yeah. And they are just experience, they're allowing themselves to experience life through all of what's available to them. They're not waiting for science to catch up and give them a, what's a pass to be able right. to accept I have, I have that something. Yeah. they're just, it just is. So they're tuning into the energetic sense, which again is beyond the five senses. And we often don't realize that we are radiating this stuff into our energy field that's around our body, also known as our aura. We've got the energy of the body, but then you also have energy all around you that is emitting from you. And you're giving communication signals, often unknowingly, that, that are picked up. Ah. And, and cats are just 
they're just so interesting. My cats, I'll sometimes just be sitting there and my cat will just be looking like above my head and there's, and I'll just keep looking at them. What are you looking at? And there's nothing that I can see there, but it's obviously something there. Yes. And they're like on alert, like just watching. <laughs> and yeah. I've had one of my cats is she will turn on a dime. Like she'll be super nice and then she'll just swat for no reason. But I've had her just come up completely out of the blue and attack my leg. And I'm like, where did that come from? What is, right. what is there that you don't like or whatever? Right. And really unexplainable where I hadn't even been interacting with her at all. But yeah, they're very mysterious in that way because they do pick up and respond to so much outside of our perception. Uh, yeah. Outside of our visible range, let's say mm -hmm. the same thing you were speaking of. Yeah. I had just incidentally, I, I last, I think it was my last pair of cats. Pretty sure it was. I, I don't think I've had cats. Yeah, no, it's not true. So I had, I had two more cats, but anyways, two, two runs ago, two cats ago, two cat pairs ago. I was living in a rural area in Illinois temporarily while I was working uh, in Lafayette. And this home that I was sitting was known to be a haunted house. It was like known. It was like, and I have to tell you, if I did, had not believed in ghosts at any time before then, it was very clear that ghosts live in that house. So it's, I get it. I don't, no convincing necessary. Like stuff would happen and it'd be like, that certainly was, I, that isn't what happened without a ghost. The only way that could have happened was a ghost, that kind of thing. Wow. So there was a point where I was sleeping up in the bedroom and I felt the presence of some, some ghost and it was something in my room, actually at the foot of the bed, walking to the foot of the bed. And I felt it and I was like concerned. What are you even doing? Why are you even here? What are you, what's the point? What are you up to? And I was concerned. My cats both saw the ghost and they went hissing. The two of them were just hissing at this thing at the bottom of the bed that didn't exist. Wow. It was really extraordinary that they could cross over the realms at that level. And I, it was like, I already knew there was a ghost there. And it wasn't like I was saying, it's not, I didn't pass it on to my cats. It was just like, oh, this is confirmation. And that was like the ultimate, again, just another confirmation of the beingness of these creatures. So let's speak it real briefly then to what is meditation and mindfulness allow one to do with respect to our relationship to our unique frequency and vibrations and how it emanates. Is there an intimate relationship between medit my meditation, my mindfulness, and my capacity to work with my vibrations and frequencies in how it interrelates with the people in the world around me? And if so, what can I expect if I become someone who learns how to meditate effectively, maybe by using some of the things that you teach? Yeah, that's wonderful. There definitely is a, and those are interrelated, adopting a meditation practice and then being able to go deeper into understanding and ex really it's about experiencing energy and yourself as vibration. So the, it, when we began this section of the top of the topic, you talked about noise and the noise that comes with meditation. And so when I think of noise, I think of scattered, like non-rhythmic, right. like chaotic. Right. Interference to meditation. Yeah. Where it's just this kind of chaos and it's, there's not, Static. it's not harmonic. Yeah. yeah. And it's e erratic. And a lot of us are just living like that all the time where the energy right. is just firing away and it's not cohesive. It's not rhythmic. It's not smooth. It's not communicating with the brain. The heart's not communicating with the brain. The two hemispheres of the brain aren't communicating to each other. And these are missed opportunities. This is the way we're meant to live is in more of a harmonious, resonant state. And that's where you really, that's where the rubber really starts to meet the road in terms of adopting a meditation practice, because it's not like you need to consciously work on, okay, I'm going to harmonize my frequency or I'm going to experience myself as energy in my experience. And everybody's different, but I was very interested in meditation when I first began a meditation practice, but I had a hard time really experiencing it. Even sure. though I was interested in it, it was very difficult for me to like tune into. That was something that just developed over time. So there are a lot of different meditation techniques 
and a lot of different kind of things that are good. For example, if you're wanting to really work on your emotional state, your compassion, your kind of heart opening, then, then there are particular meditations that will help to open up more to the flow of love and so forth. If you have more of a mental, intellectual slant to life, then you may enjoy more of like the pineal gland and the and meditations where you're telling yourself or a story, you're following along a story or something where it's more in, in the brain. But there are a lot of different paths and a lot of different techniques. There are types of meditations where you do focus on one thing to help strengthen your focus. But then there are other types of meditation where it's like they're objectless meditations, where it's like you just are trying to merge with everything and not have not zeroing in on something. Mm -hmm. These are all really valid types of meditation. None of those being directly tied to energy. I feel like when we want to experience energy, it's not necessarily like the low hanging fruit. When it comes to a meditation practice, it's a byproduct or something that builds more over time naturally behind the scenes. It's right. one of those, oh, suddenly your energy is harmonizing. Your brain is, your heart and your brain are more connected. Your heart and your gut are more connected. You're feeling more connected to everything. You might you might experience your pets, for example, in a different way where you feel more tuned in and you're just noticing signals that you're getting from them that you can't put your finger on why you feel like they, that they want to go outside or whatever, or that they, how did I know they were out of food? And I haven't been in the, that area of the house for hours. Exactly. So it's like just developing a meditation practice and working on it in whatever way you feel guided to do, that seems to be something that comes into play automatically and behind the scenes. And then you can get more deliberate. At least again, this was my experience. It was like just this, the more I did it, the more I was just tuning into the gotcha. feelings within me. And I was able to, now I do healing work, for example. So that's like, not only being able to connect with that energy and feel that energy and kind of move it around and feel like there's some control of what I want to do with it, but then being able to harness that and deliver it to somebody else so that they can utilize it for their own healing. And so it's a, an iterative part yeah. of meditation, I would say. Awesome. That's great. That's a great explanation. And thank you so much for all the interrelatability and the interlocking nuances of how meditation in real world really works and what's really here, including this idea that you, it's not necessarily the outcome that you're speaking of being more in tune with oneself may not necessarily be even what you're after, but it takes place as a byproduct of simply sitting and simply being in silence or simply being in the meditative state as a practice, as something that I do day to day. And I may not notice, I wonder sometimes are those 20 minutes first thing in the morning, just me attempting to extend my sleep another 20 minutes. <laughs> it's just a calm thing to do. And, but it's very valuable and leads me to a, a life that actually seems to work much more effectively as a function of my frequent, of my now present meditative practice. And I'm sure your students and clients also feel that same experience. So Kara, how, what do you do and you know what where can people expect to find you if they're interested in exploring what it is that you offer either at a corporate level or an individual level what are some of the things that we can expect and how can people find you to actually you know learn more about that and get your services in their back pocket yeah, thank you for that opportunity to share that. As you mentioned, I have the podcast Meditation Conversation. That's pretty low-hanging fruit for everybody. I've got like over 300 episodes out there with wonderful guests like Dr. Fred. Lots of different topics around consciousness and the reality, the real reality beyond the, the surface. And then I have a website called karagoodwin.com. I spell Kara with a K. And on there, I have a community that I meet with regularly and we do online meditations. I live in Indiana. So those who are here in town, sometimes we get together in person too. I've, there's, there are tons of resources on there too. There's all the recordings and guided meditations and 
lots of things to help to keep your meditation practice strong. I love to run retreats. I've got a retreat coming up in January in Indiana in a, a Mongolian, Tibetan, Buddhist cultural center out in nature. It's a fantastic site. We'll have sound healings. We'll have Beautiful. meditations, obviously, breath yeah. work, workshops and things like that. And then I've been really enjoying lately doing like personalized audio meditations. Meditations is like the general thing that I would say, but I, they're actually energy transmissions. So depending on how new you are to meditation, then guided meditation is enough. But if you do understand energy, it's conveying, it's transferring energy through my voice, through a meditation. And it's like doing the heavy lifting for people. So people are using these for post-surgery, healing, right. PTSD, manifestation, all of that kind of stuff. So that's really fun. And that's on my website too. So there are a lot of different resources yeah. out there. Yeah, clearly very talented and uh, very comprehensive in your approach and understanding the, the extent of the power of uh, meditation and uh, also probably understanding that you've you're still at the tip of the iceberg of what's available on the far ends of what meditation can offer. So thank you for being you. Thank you for being so mindful. Thank you for really a, a great stimulating and beautiful conversation about the interactivity between stillness and life or between humans and animals or between noise and uh, quietness and all those things that we were able to touch on in this, in this conversation. Thank you for letting people know where to find you. And thank you for being a guest and a friend. It's really a spectacular to have met you this week and I, or this month. And I, I think we've also, there, I was on a podcast yesterday that they, that I believe you referred me to. So that was really fun as well. And I look forward to our continued relationship. So Kara, mm -hmm. thank you for being on the healthy healer, clearly an example of a healthy healer who earned her stripes on the way in. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Fred. So great to collaborate with you again. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this as much as I did, please continue to, to share and to comment. To, to, and of course, to subscribe because that's what's going to grow the whole uh, podcast so that people like you and people like the ones that you know should have heard this will get easy access to these episodes. So thanks for being here. Thanks for staying to the end. And of course, look forward to uh, our short coming later on this week, as well as uh, continued episodes along the line of Healthy Healers. So bye for now. We'll catch you on the flip side.